Hello, everyone. Hello and welcome. I am, uh, I'm Reed 650 founder and editor Ed McCann, and I will be your host this afternoon. And before we get started, uh, I ask the usual that you silence uh, all your electronic devices, but not before tweeting and Instagramming where you are and what you're doing with hashtags Reed 650 and Sitter Winery NYC. Uh, videography or audio recording of the show is prohibited, though I do encourage you to snap photos and even post to social media right now this minute, letting all your friends know that this is the coolest place to be on Sunday afternoon in New York City. Um, as many of you know, Read 650 takes its name from the maximum word count of the personal stories we present on our stage and in our regular podcast. 650 words translates to a five-minute spoken word performance. And holding a reader or a listener's attention uh, in that frame is no easy feat, uh, not as easy as you might think, but all the talented writers that you're going to meet today have risen to the challenge, and we are delighted to return to the City Winery stage and spend time among uh, people like you who value writers and writing and whom I have come to think of as members of my tribe. Um, I thank you all for joining us this afternoon to support good writing and the spoken word. The theme of today's event is show business, and we have curated a baker's dozen stories from the far-flung corners of the entertainment world to present this afternoon in two acts. And so we're going to get started right away. We're going to open act one with Margarita Meyendorf, who is also known to her friends and professionally as Morka. And Morka was born displaced in a refugee camp in Germany, and she's the author of the published memoir, DP, Displaced Person. Um, she has performed as an actress, a dancer, a musician, and a storyteller at venues throughout the United States and in Europe. And her most recent published work is an anthology of short stories based on her life's adventures, and that is called Flipping the Bird. Morka returns to the Reed 650 stage today to open Act One with a tale of survival, determination, and finally, a break. She traveled here from her Hudson Valley home to read Script in Hand. Please give a warm welcome to Margarita Meindorf. When I told my mother that I was leaving home to become an actress in New York City, she threw a pot of hot potato soup at me. <laughs> she couldn't understand my need to escape the tiny dark apartment in Nyack, New York, with the camphor-scented claustrophobia, the sickness and sadness that permeated the walls. I had to leave, and I did, with potato soup on my shoes. <laughs> I was only 19 and determined to make it in New York. I moved in with my cousin, began attending dance, acting, and singing classes. I answered the cattle call auditions where, usually after hours of waiting, the director, with one swift gesture of his hand, would dismiss an entire group of five foot three inch blondes, of which I was one. <laughs> For nourishment, I ate 25-cent hot dogs with sauerkraut and made free hot water and ketchup soup at the Automat. There was an almost instant descent down to the dregs of show business. I began go-go dancing in bars to make ends meet. Men leered as I danced in cages with my fringe, fishnet stockings, and red high heels. Then a break. I was hired not as a star or even in a small part, and not in New York, but in Philadelphia. I was backstage as wardrobe mistress for the nude musical, Old Calcutta. <laughs> but backstage was magical. 
and I breathed in the perfumed whiff of glamour, actors rushing past in costume or naked, and I felt a thrill in the reflected light and scandalous fame. The soupçon of show business glitz stopped when Frank Rizzo, the mayor, closed the show because of the nudity and obscenity. My dreams of stardom vanished. But visions of hot potato soup catapulting through the air spurred me on. <laughs> then in December 1969, two years after pounding the pavement, auditioning for acting roles in New York City, I got a call that I landed the character role in the theatrical version of an old Doris Day film, a comedy entitled Tunnel of Love. Within a week, I was sitting in a Piedmont air puddle jumper heading for a four-month tour in the Carolinas and Georgia. I was going to be fed, housed, and paid as a professional actress. I wasn't sure who was flying higher, me or the plane. <laughs> night after night, I made a surprise entrance in full bloom of a stage pregnancy. Strapping on my fake belly didn't feel that glamorous, but I got laughs. I wanted more. When the tour ended in Atlanta and I was packing my bags to go home, the producer called. He was gasping. Susan, the star of his next show, The Owl and the Pussycat, had the flu and could not go on. He begged me to get the script read the part of Doris, and board the first plane to Charlotte, North Carolina. Please, he said, we open tonight. <laughs> the leading man, Robert Kuyper, and I had two hours to read and block the show. I wore sick Susan's wardrobe and her oversized blonde wig. Makeup was slapped onto my face, and I stood backstage as the producer explained to a packed audience that I would be playing the role of the pussycat, script in hand. Could I pull this off? The curtain rose. For one and a half hours, I laughed. I cried, I whirled, I became Doris, a charming part-time prostitute who falls for Felix, a nerdy bookworm writer. This, even though several times the script flew out of my hands and I lost the wig when I flipped Robert from behind a couch. <laughs> the audience was in stitches. Thanks to Robert, who always stayed in his owl character, no matter what happened on stage, I was able to sail in the part of the pussycat. I stayed up all night waiting for that review. The next day, the Charlotte, North Carolina Observer ran a front page headline. Script in hand, she saved and stole the show. John Gredler is a poet, a memoirist, a prize-winning essayist, and a frequent contributor to Read 650. A recipient of the Catherine Gerfine Fellowship from the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College, John's work has been published in Atticus Review, Narratively, The Sun Magazine, Westchester Review, Talking Writing, and others. He lives with his family in Tuckahoe, New York, and joins us today with a tale of art and antiques and attraction. Here to present his story, Bedroom Eyes, is John Gredler. Back in 1980, when I was 23, I got hired by the art dealer Michael Hall to help renovate his brownstone on East 80th Street. Michael had been a minor Hollywood actor in his younger years. His biggest part was a small role in a great movie, The Best Years of Our Lives. He played Frederick March and Myrna Loy's son. Michael made only a few grade B westerns after that. Realizing he'd never make it big in pictures, 
He moved to New York and became involved with Sir John Pope Hennessy, curator of European paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. Sir John was disappointed when Michael chose to become an art dealer instead of a scholar. When Michael saw how much museums were willing to pay for these rare works, he wanted to be the one discovering them and the one doing the selling. One day, while I was painting the foyer, the doorbell rang. There was a tall, good-looking older man wearing a tux under an overcoat. Hello there, is Michael in? No, he just went out. Oh, please tell him that Lincoln stopped by. As, I, as he turned to go, I realized he was Lincoln Kirstein, founder of the New York City Ballet with Balanchine. When I told Michael, he said in a knowing tone, Lincoln Center was named after him, you know. <laughs> I found out later this was false. <laughs> that much of what Michael said was true in his mind only. Another day I was busy cleaning a crystal chandelier in the living room when Michael came in followed by an elegantly dressed older woman. John, this is Paulette Goddard. I came down from the ladder to say hello. Her eyes were a startling emerald green. Her mesmerizing gaze, frank and sexual. Bedroom eyes. I was caught off guard, surprised I could be aroused by a woman so much older. She had a charismatic aloofness about her. So used to being desired, it was no surprise to her that she had made an impression on me. I stuttered an awkward hello, and she smiled, her eyes showing amusement. I went back to work feeling a bit off kilter. I tried to recall what movies she had starred in, remembering her as the street urchin in Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. I knew she had been married to Chaplin and also to Eric Maria Remarque, the writer of All Quiet on the Western Front. A while later, Michael wanted me to go downtown with him to pick up some lumber. He asked Paulette if she would like a ride home. It's just my old Jeep, you know, not what you're used to. He liked to pretend he was much poorer than he was to his rich friends. She agreed to ride with us, and we all squeezed into the front seat of his old Cherokee, Paulette in the middle. As, <laughs> As we drove down Park Avenue, I sat thigh to thigh with a real movie star, imagining her as her younger self. Maybe she was imagining too. We stopped in front of her apartment building. I opened the car door and helped her out. I looked one more time into those alluring green eyes. On the way back uptown, Michael said, I think she liked you, John. I've known her a long time now. She's alone now, you know. <laughs> Remark died years ago. She's quite a woman. We go back many years to my days in Hollywood. You know, she has promised me the portrait that Diego Rivera painted of her. It's wonderful, life-size. They were lovers, you know. <laughs> it's hanging in her apartment here in New York. Maybe you'll get to go up and see it sometime, if you play your cards right. I did eventually get to see the painting. Ten years later, when it went on view at Christie's <laughs> as part of Paulette's estate, she did not bequeath it to Michael. I guess I didn't play my cards right. Apparently, Michael didn't either. <laughs> Thank you.
Martha Mitchell is a graphic designer and a writer who has lived in New York, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Arizona, Utah, and California. She now lives in Maine in a repurposed 150-year-old textile mill overlooking a dam. And it's a home she shares with an elderly hound dog named Hank and a cat named Professor who alert her to bats and ghosts. Martha has attended the writing workshop, uh, the writing institute at Sarah Lawrence College and the Westport Writers Workshop, and she took note when her niece Joanna said, shh, Aunt Martha's telling a story. <laughs> Deciding to broaden her audience, she came in second at her first Moth Story Slam, and she's flattered when asked why her parents would name her after someone connected to Watergate, since, she says, she was absolutely born before 1972. <laughs> The story she contributes to today's show business event is entitled Hall of Fame. Please welcome Martha Mitchell. Backlit by the early morning sun, the Fox soundstage looms over the parking lot, tall palm fronds glistening above the roof line. The sight of it makes me a little nervous. A friend has suggested I go on the game show, Greed. It'll be fun, he said. You could win $2 million. I'd been watching episodes to prepare. The first question was an elimination round. The answer, always numerical. Only the player with the wrongest answer would be cut. I just needed to be less wrong than four other people. <laughs> After that, it was all multiple choice. Inside, I sign a thick stack of waivers. A stage manager barks directions. You've all been assigned teams. We'll be taping the college teams first, so we may not even get to you today. Maybe this will just be a dry run? For hours, we sit on hard chairs or the floor watching the college teams on the monitors. Legally, we are not allowed to talk or read anything so as not to study trivia or get into cahoots with our teammates. At one o'clock, my game readiness draining, I'm hungry. At 2.30, I've been waiting for six hours. I don't think they're gonna get to us. There's no need to be nervous. At four o'clock, next team. We're led down a long, plain hallway to makeup, another long hallway to wardrobe, a third to a small waiting room with a low ceiling, some chairs, and a plant. An illuminated sign, recording in progress, hands, hangs next to the stage doors. This is actually going to happen. It drops on me like a fat velvet curtain. Chills, shakes, nausea, stage fright. My intestines are feeling unreliable. I'm going to vomit. I look for a trash can. That plant might work. <laughs> My teammates all look fine. But I can't do this. What about all the releases I signed? How do I find my way back down all those hallways? They hand out scripted introductions. The slip of paper shakes in my hand. I read it. Oh, no, no, what will my dad say? They've taken my audition remark about seeing the Rolling Stones and turned it into, I just can't get enough satisfaction. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them I'm sick. My panic is interrupted by the stage manager. Okay, here we go. The doors open, and there it is, the stage. I'm moving forward like a calf with a herd. To the right, at the edge of the lights, the audience, tiny, just five rows of people. To the left, Chuck Woolery smiling us in. The moment I'm through the door, I feel like a rock star. I stand up straighter. I stride to my podium. I own this place. I'm home. <laughs> I say my name in scripted introduction. I'm surely shining as bright as any stage light. Chuck holds up a card and reads. How many people are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Hmm, it's been around for 10 years. Count the whole band, not just the lead singers. Mick, Keith, Bill, Ronnie. Okay, average five per band, 50, that's probably close. <laughs> Wrong. In 1999, there were already 300, over 300 inductees. <laughs> I am the wrongest. <laughs> <laughs> 
I ham up a big dramatic reaction. Chuck bids me farewell. Backstage, dark, save for what's radiating from the set, the director approaches. Oh no, you're so rock and roll. We definitely will have you back sometime. <laughs> I hear the next three questions. What character appears on bubblegum wrappers? How many lines in a limerick? Where would you bump into a stalactite? I know all this. A stagehand appears with my things, guides me mere steps to the exit door and says, thanks. She pushes the door open and I am outside in the parking lot. The LA sun still shining brightly. Just on the other side of the corrugated wall, my team is answering questions, maybe winning millions. I stand in the sun and blink. David Masello moved to New York from Evanston, Illinois, and he has made his living as a writer and editor for more than 30 years. Uh, beginning his career as a nonfiction book editor at Simon & Schuster, and then moving on to senior editorial positions at many magazines, including Travel and Leisure, Art and Antiques, and Town and Country. Uh, he is a widely published essayist, poet, and playwright, and his work appears in the New York Times, Best American Essays, and numerous literary and art magazines. And he currently serves as executive editor of Milieu, a magazine about design and architecture. He's also the author of three books about art and architecture and joins us here today with a story of how art imitates or sometimes even improves on life. His piece is titled Curtain Up. Please welcome David Masello. I wrote a two-character play called Fjords during the pandemic. The story concerns a middle-aged man who opens his apartment door to greet his young, beautiful Norwegian neighbor across the hall after having invited him to share a meal. The two sit in their respective vestibules, safely distanced, separated by the common hallway, a buzz with fluorescent lights to eat, drink, converse, conflict. In real life, my 35-story Manhattan building had mostly vacated days into the pandemic, and my neighbor across the hall and I were the only two left on our floor. As my character admits in the play, and as I can admit as that real-life character, I was lonely during that time. The idea of a meal with a neighbor, albeit an unfriendly one, became a fantasy. <laughs> The play was accepted by a theater in Greenwich Village, slated for four performances in winter 2022, part of a festival of one acts. To expedite the casting, the director and stage manager held auditions in my apartment, <laughs> directly across from the apartment in which the inspiration for the stage character lived, a Norse-like god who never responded to that invitation slipped under his door to share that meal. Handsome actors came into and out of my apartment auditioning for the role. The real life version sometimes coming into and out of his apartment just as the actors were coming and going. <laughs> he never knew that these men, replicating Norwegian accents, were auditioning to play a conversational version of him. <laughs> he remained chilly, remote, Though we'd sometimes share the elevator, grunt at opposite ends of our building's gym. In my play, the character, whose first name is that of my Scandinavian neighbors, <laughs> ultimately defrosts, thaws to the idea of sharing a meal at that time in our collective history when New York silenced. His character goes from iceberg-like to a melting warmth and perhaps even a lukewarm flirtation because he's lonely too during the pandemic, hungry not for a meal but for company, a connection with someone. Fjord references that geological glacial phenomenon and getting the play to assume form required eons of rehearsals. Some held in rented theatrical spaces, others in the small geography of my one bedroom. With the cast in place, we became an ensemble, 
Images I'd related in the script were conveyed to the audience through the gestures and talents of the actors. Dogs barking on passing East River barges, pings of flagpoles at night, clouds billowing past windows, a scent of cologne wafting across the hallway. During the third performance, a standing room only house, the older actor went blank on stage, thrown by a malfunctioning prop, a faux candle that burned out mid-speech. He stood there, glacially frozen in the black box theater, <laughs> a blizzard of dust motes smoldering in the spotlight for, well, the time it takes a fjord to form. <laughs> he recovered, improvised, and the audience appeared unaware he'd gone off script. My play about our all having been marooned during the pandemic, alone, unable to be with each other, had brought the cast together as friends. So when we left the theater to hug on McDougal Street, there was a collective ache among us, a re-haunting of the aloneness we'd experienced the prior year. We emerged from the theater into a world reopened, curtain up, the village crowded with students, tourists, New Yorkers. It seems the curtain has gone up on a new, real-life second act, though the script is all improvised. For that real-life neighbor, who still doesn't know of the play's existence, <laughs> did one day cross my threshold and into my living room to talk, eat herring I'd bought for the occasion, <laughs> and become a friend amid real candlelight as he describes his country's northern lights. The colored gases and vapors stir in the air like the original ingredients of earth and life, he says prophetically, fingering another disgusting herring. <laughs> On land, my living room, the fjord waters continue to flow and warm as they follow their course. Anne Casapini is a yoga and meditation instructor who also loves to write, sing, and dance salsa. Her work has been published in various anthologies and in literary publications such as The Sun, Dunes Review, and Intima, a journal of narrative medicine. She's a regular contributor to Read 650 and lives in Tuckahoe, New York with her husband, son, and dog, Rocky. And Anne's contribution to today's show business event is a personal story entitled Dancing Backward Upstairs. Please give a warm welcome to Anne Casapini. It's 1985. I'm rehearsing a high camp musical comedy, The Adventures of Rock and Roll Rabbit, <laughs> Quest for the Iron Butterfly, at La Mama Theater on East 4th Street in Manhattan. I play Inna of the three-person Greek chorus Inna, Gada, and Vida. <laughs> Singing three-part harmonies, dancing in an orange mini dress and five-inch heels, while playing a prop guitar in the shape of a carrot. <laughs> My friend Chico Casinwa has written the show. His partner Andre De Shields is directing. Andre is a man of high standards, demanding and uncompromising. Andre is teaching us new choreography. He wants us to walk backwards, up the center staircase, eyes forward to the audience in floor-length choir robes and those same five-inch heels. After several times, tripping each time, I say, Andre, I just don't think I can do it. The next day, Andre shows up for rehearsal in a long robe and six-inch platform shoes. <laughs> Without explanation, he places himself in front of the bottom stair, has the musical director play my number, 
and proceeds to belt out the song while dancing backwards up the stairs with ease. He then comes over to me, smiles, and whispers in my ear, just do it. <laughs> After practicing the moves at least 30 more times, I did. Chico and I had met while performing in a touring bilingual production of Don Quixote. I played Dulcinea, Don Quixote's lady love. As we traveled around the country, we became best friends. He was talented, funny, and generous. After that tour, Chico encouraged me to audition for a French director he knew. We both got hired to teach and act in Ligouge, a small village two hours north of Paris. There we presented an outdoor spectacle. Even now, more than 30 years later, I can still see the powerful scene that ended in a pieta tableau, Chico as a young man killed by the KKK lying in his mother's arms. On our days off, we wandered together in fields of tournesol, sunflowers, and developed crushes on various French men. Andre flew over to see our final performance. From there, Chico suggested I audition for a role in a show in Paris featuring American songs of the 60s. It had already opened at the Théâtre de Bataclan, and they needed a replacement. I got the role, a dream come true. I lived and worked in Paris for six more fabulous weeks. Chico was my angel. Our lives continued to intertwine. When I returned to the States, I began a new part-time job teaching ESL to Russian refugees. Then Chico was hired, too. The students adored him, of course. The following year, Chico baked my wedding cake, a three-tiered chocolate confection. Chico and Andre read poetry selections at our ceremony. Seven years of friendship had gone by. It was now 1992, and my beloved friend Chico was getting thinner and thinner. Chico had been the master chef in his relationship. Now Andre learned to cook their meals, but even Ayurvedic recipes couldn't help. Chico was hospitalized in June. He was dying of AIDS. Now I wanted to be his angel. I wanted to dance backwards the way Andre had taught me and tell Chico that he could beat this, just do it. But all I could do was sing to him each hospital visit. I sang even after he stopped speaking, after he stopped opening his eyes. I sang not knowing if he could hear me. On my last day with him, I tried to sing our favorite Lerner and Lowe song, Follow Me, but my voice was broken. Instead, I leaned in close and spoke the lyrics sotto voce. World, farewell. World, goodbye. We shall fly. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Producer Jim Russick created advertising and built memorable entertainment brands that have played to generations of audiences. He helped launch a chorus line on Broadway. He led the ad campaign for Francis Ford Coppola's national tour of Napoleon launched the Big Apple Circus at Lincoln Center, and a phenomenon you may have heard of called Stomp. He also created decades of award-winning work for Lincoln Center Theater. And away from work, Jim is part news junkie and part avid baseball fan. He conceived and produced the critically acclaimed musical reviews Bush Wars and Me the People, the Trump America musical. He also partnered with Bill Spaceman Lee to create a barnstorming team of former Boston Red Sox players, the New England Gray Sox. 
Jim closes act one of today's show with a story from the beginning of his career working in live primetime television. The piece is called A Giant Step Up. Please welcome Jim Russick. The stage deli smelled like the hallway in my grandmother's Brooklyn apartment house. <laughs> Chicken soup with undertones of garlic and overtones of celery and dill. Two corned beef on rye, I shout, one with mustard, a tongue sandwich on rye, trim the schlung, and if you don't, I return in 15 minutes and I want my tip back. <laughs> Oh, the food was not for me. I was the studio production assistant on The Ed Sullivan Show, the coffee boy. The previous season, I was backstage as a CBS page, answering phones, looking around the studio for so-and-so's agent, and once helping pull the Rolling Stones through the front door of the studio to avoid the mob at the stage door around the corner. But now, I was in a suit and tie schlepping to the stage deli for the producer and the director's lunch, a giant step up. <laughs> a few shows into the 67 season, the cue card guy was promoted to full-time production assistant, and I was next in line for his job, a job I would keep for four seasons. I wrote down George Burns' act in his suite at the Plaza Hotel. I sat at the coffee shop next to the theater with Sid Caesar, who told me someday I'd be a producer. I put Joan Rivers' routine on cards a dozen times. She gave me a generous tip after every appearance and invited me to see her act at downstairs at the upstairs. And at the end of my first season, she thanked me with a weighty, solid silver pen. And then there was the time Lainey Kazan sang Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now. <laughs> a song way out of this great jazz singer's repertoire. A song whose lyrics do not repeat. She needed cue cards and she needed glasses. <laughs> Which meant the letters on the cue cards had to be four inches tall which meant there were 10 stanzas of clouds and loves and life's illusions <laughs> in four inch high letters, <laughs> occupying dozens of cards. Cue cards are written on 22 inch by 28 inch poster board. You punch two holes at the top and use loose leaf rings to hold them together so you can flip them. I would write in all capital letters with the liquid ink magic marker the fumes from which could get you high as an elephant's eye. <laughs> the lyrics from both sides now must have weighed 100 pounds. <laughs> and of course, Lainey was not going to stand frozen. The choreographer had given her traveling all over the stage. I had to know which of three cameras had the shot in any given moment so I wouldn't get in the picture as Lainey well, ran around the stage. <laughs> Dress rehearsal went great. I learned where to position myself, but the cards were so heavy, the binder rings were cutting through them. I sent for reinforcements, those little lifesavers you lick and stick on the... As the clock struck eight on Sunday night, the Ed Sullivan Show was live across America. During the final commercial break, Lainey Kazan comes out to her mark, as do I. 60 seconds later, Mr. Sullivan reads his introduction from a teleprompter. Music starts, and here we go. Rows and flows of angel hair. <laughs> and ice cream castles in the air. And the very first card tears through the binder rings as I flip it. <laughs> Rather than juggle, I toss the card into the snake pit of cables behind the center camera. Now I'm ducking under camera lenses to keep in front of Laney. I'm reading lyrics upside down to know when to flip and the cards and ripping them once she's sung the lyrics. 
And by the end, cards are scattered everywhere. <laughs> Lainey gets a huge ovation. And I have sweat rings down to the patch pockets of my suit jacket. <laughs> but I am officially in show business. <laughs> Read 650 is a nonprofit literary organization with a mission to promote and create performance opportunities for writers. And in a publishing environment where it is often challenging to find or to hear new voices, we take that mission seriously. And we've worked hard to create this quality platform for writers and an entertaining and memorable experience for you, our friends, and our guests. I am Read 650's Chief Everything Officer. And this passion project of mine has been my second full-time job since 2014. And in organizing Read 650 as a 501c3 nonprofit, I built something I don't own and which cannot be owned, but rather is steered and shepherded along by people who share my passion for good writing and the spoken word. And I made this choice because the fuel that drives the entire enterprise is the words of these talented writers. And to profit from that felt wrong. And while I'm not a great businessman, I am proud to feature their fine work. They're happy to present. You're glad to be here. And at a time in our culture when it can seem that we're just marinating in negativity, gathering like this to share stories and fellowship and food and wine can feel like a real gift. And it is something that nourishes all of us. Our volunteer editorial team places a strong emphasis on the craft of writing. And they read dozens and sometimes over 100 uh, submissions on each topic before selecting the work that we present and recorded events like this one, many of which have a second life in the podcast we launched as part of Carnegie Hall's Citywide Spring Festival in April of last year. And just to call out a couple of the folks who keep the wheels turning, Sarah Caldwell, who records video and sound, is our volunteer chief technology officer who also assists day and night with work related to our website and social media messaging and podcast uploads. And Jim Rusick, whom you just met, donates his time and talent to help with marketing and to assemble and mix our bi-weekly half-hour podcast. Our ambition is to scale up, to attract more writers, more followers, more listeners, and in addition to our podcast, to establish a home on public radio where we belong. And that's what we're working to do. We have largely been self-funded since our inception, and I've always believed that the return on the investment of all this time and effort and money would come through underwriting and sponsor support once we land on, on public radio, but we're not quite there yet. And while a portion of the ticket that you purchased for today's show flows through to us from City Winery, we don't yet receive grants or sponsorships or any outside funding beyond gifts from our donors. And the truth is that we need those funds to offset our basic operating costs and to begin to pay for an intern, a grant writer, and some marketing assistance. And your help will take us to that next level. And so I'm speaking from my heart today to ask directly for your support. Uh, you do make it possible for us to continue this work, and your gift is an investment in our mission. And so weeks ahead of Giving Tuesday, which I know is a very crowded space, and there are lots of very worthy organizations to support, um, we have set a fundraising goal of $10,000. And I ask that you please consider a tax-deductible gift today in any amount to help us get there. On the back of your program, you will find a link and a scannable code that will take you to the donation page of our website with options for a credit card or PayPal. And during the reception following our program, our own Rhonda Zangwill, a lady in the gray dress who's waving, who you probably can't see over there, will have a credit card swiper and RFID cards if you prefer to contribute that way. So I thank you for considering the request. Thank you all so much for being here to support good writers and good writing. And we're going to pause here for a short break of about 25 minutes. And when you hear this bell, this one, which is the bell that my mother rang my whole life when it was dinner time. God bless mom. So mom is here with us. Um, please head back to your seats for more great storytelling in Act Two. So 25 minutes. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome back to the second half of today's show, Show Business. And before we bring up our next writer, I want to remind you that we are always working to feature new and diverse voices, and we are accepting submissions for upcoming shows about ancestry and identity, about women in music as part of Carnegie Hall's 2023 Spring Festival, and about mothers and mothering and motherhood. And we are also always interested in essays for Between the Lines, which is a regular feature of our podcast and that is uh, the, the place where we invite writers of all genres to write about absolutely any aspect of writing and the writing life, uh, including 
all the ways you may have found to procrastinate, uh, your favorite, you know, where you like to sit or what motivates you. And I was telling someone earlier, um, and you can, you can find these on our website um, under the news, the news tab. Sally uh, Schwartz, who's a comedy writer, um, a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, had written a piece about how in order to write, she needs it to be absolutely quiet. She can't write if it's not quiet. And she also can't write if the dishwasher hasn't been unloaded. And she can't, she can't write if her hair's not tied back. She can't, you know, it's like all these things. And it, just, it was just one of, um, of, there's such a wide range of expression there. Suzanne McConnell, who had been a student of Kurt Vonnegut's at the Iowa Writing Workshop, uh, had really written about her experiences um, with him and, and what she had learned at, at that. And it was like uh, the, the opposite ends of the spectrum, this, this remarkable, uh, Kind of epiphany that, that she had, you know, as a student of, of Vonnegut's, to you know Sally Schwartz about why well, you know the most important letters are S H H H. You know, you need it to be quiet. Anyway, those and incidentally, the between the lines pieces uh, don't have to be delivered. They don't have to be uh, performed on our stage. Those are things that. Um, you can also record into your phone, and you can email those. And I would love for you to follow the podcast and hear what, what those are about. And I, I've also learned the, the ways in which you can get a, almost a, a sound booth quality recording, which is to like put a quilt over your head, or sit in your car with the engine off, which is almost like a sound booth. Anyway, um, please do check that out, and please um, follow the podcast. I'm very proud of what we're building, and proud of the voices that we're featuring there. Um, there is a scannable code inside your program that will lead you to several examples of that between the lines uh, segment, which I, I think has a lot of a lot of legs, a lot of possibilities. So, um, check out the recordings. Please do encourage the writers in your life to add their voice to the chorus. You can always learn more at our website, read650.org. You can follow us on your social media of choice, and even better, I don't know if they're going around. I, they're not. There's. There's three clipboards over there, Jim, that should be going around the room. We're collecting email addresses for the twice a month newsletter. We will never share your email address and you can unsubscribe with one click at any time. But we're finding that the people who subscribe to the newsletter actually want our news and we seem to have better luck reaching and communicating with those folks than kind of you know, messages we send out on social media into the ether that I, I have no idea what, how, that, how effective any of that really is, quite honestly. But, um, so in addition to Jim and Sarah and the folks I mentioned earlier, I want to thank the other people who made this day possible, from my partner in Read 650, executive producer Richard Kolath, to editor Stephen Lewis, David Masello, Lisa Donati Mayer, and Rhonda Zangwill. Uh, we're grateful to City Winery CEO Michael Dorf, VP of Programming Shlomo Lippitz, Program Director Ryan Ertractor for their support, and to production manager and audio engineer Dan Crowley over there in the dark at the switcher. And they all should get their own and also to the Ace City Winery Kitchen and Wait Staff working to keep us all fed and watered this afternoon. Thank you very much. And now back to our show. Uh, we're going to open Act Two with Jack O'Connell, who is a New York City native and working actor with extensive film credits, including Doubt, Big Night, Inside Lewin Davis, The Paper, God's Pocket, The Quitter, Brazzaville Teenager, Everyday People, The Yards, and others. His numerous TV credits include Mad Men, Nurse Jackie, Vinyl, and the Emmy Award-winning hit Netflix hit The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Jack lives on Long Island with his wife, Margaret, and while he is a working actor, 30 years ago, he was still an aspiring one. And he opens Act Two today with a story that takes place almost on the waterfront. Please give a warm welcome to Jack O'Connell. <laughs> In May of 1991, as an aspiring actor, I was invited to participate in a staged reading of the classic On the Waterfront as part of the West Hampton Beach Writers' Festival. The cast, some professional, some amateur actors, would read the play in celebration of the 40th anniversary of the film. Bud Schulberg, author and local resident, would oversee this staged reading. My role was Longshoreman K.O. Dugan, who gets killed in the first act. <laughs> when a sling loaded with cargo gets dropped on him for uh, not going along with the bosses. The reading went very well, and we were asked for an encore 
at the John Drew Theater in East Hampton that August. Several of the actors were not available due to uh, summer stock commitments and had to be replaced. Our new director, Kelly Patton, called and said that Mr. Schulberg would like me to read the role of the priest, Father Barry. I was honored. And even though it was still a staged reading, I worked on those lines as if it were a full-scale production. We got wonderful reviews in the East Hampton Star, and by the following summer, we were taking the show on the road. First stop, Putney, Vermont, <clears throat> where we would give several sold-out readings at Landmark College. The cast and crew were fed and housed by local sponsors. My son Henry and I stayed in a furnished treehouse <laughs> on the Dodge family estate. On the way home, he said it was nicer than our own house. <laughs> The following spring, we landed in Hoboken, New Jersey, where the film was shot. With new faces in the cast, we set the stage in a former industrial space, which was a perfect backdrop. A younger actor was brought in to relieve me of my uh, priestly duties, <laughs> and I took over the role of uh, Johnny Friendly, union boss. Now, the rumors were circulating that this Showcase, this uh, reading would be a showcase, uh, Backer's audition with an eventual move to uh, a showcase in New York, in Manhattan. After the final show in Hoboken, a tall, uh, handsome woman walked toward me and introduced herself as Patricia Kennedy Lawford, a longtime friend and associate of Mr. Schulberg. So the backers were in the house. A few months later, November 1993, we opened for a 12 performance showcase production with original music by Leonard Bernstein, full mood lighting at Theater Row Theater on 420 West 42nd Street. The show was a huge, the show was a huge hit. Opening night was thrilling. Elia Kazan, who directed the film, was in the audience, mm -hmm. along with Jerry Orbach and Chris North from Law and & Order, and many other casting people and agents. After the final performance, the champagne flowed, as did hors d'oeuvres from Zabar's. <laughs> <laughs> Just as exciting, a legitimate agent asked me to drop by his office to discuss representation. Then in early 1994, the word came down. On the waterfront was moving to Broadway. <laughs> the show would be produced by Dodger Productions with a planned May 1995 opening. Four years, four years after our first reading in West Hampton Beach. What a ride it had been, except for the fact that my ride was over. None of the cast from the showcase would be in the Broadway show. I was distraught. About a week after previews began, I walked over to the Brooks Atkinson Theater to see who would be playing my role. I tell you, it was like watching an old girlfriend, all dressed up, <laughs> in heels and makeup, walking off with her new beau. I'm not sure if I felt vindicated that the Broadway transfer closed after eight performances. <laughs> now, six years later, in that dark autumn of 2001, I'm playing the lead in Arthur Miller's All My Sons when Bud Schulberg shows up in my dressing room after a matinee performance. After the usual chit-chat, small talk, he says to me, I had nothing to do, that he had nothing to do with the casting of the Broadway transfer of his show. I step back. I look at him, perplexed, and I ask, <clears throat> and what show was that, lovey? <laughs> he left, I left, we hugged. Well, I guess that's showbiz. <laughs> Thank you. 
Edward M. Cohen's plays have been produced all over Off-Broadway, off and for many years he was an associate director of New York's Jewish Repertory Theater. He's been a fellow at the Elbert, uh, Edward Albee Foundation and the O'Neill Playwrights Conference, and he's received grants from the NEA and the New York State Council on the Arts. Edward's story collection, Before Stonewall, was published by Aust Press. His novel, $250,000, is from G.P. Putnam Sons, and his novella, A Visit to My Father with My Son, is by Running Wild Press. Now, we all know that certain fragrances, objects, or actions can be powerful triggers to distant memories. And as you are about to hear with Edward's story entitled Peeling an Egg, please say hello to Edward M. Cohen. In 1971, I was a hot young playwright who had had a play produced at a classy off-off Broadway house and another accepted by the O'Neill Theater in Connecticut where August Wilson had started, also Meryl Streep, Swoozie Kurtz, John Guare. The competition to get in was intense. Out of 1,400 scripts, 12 had been accepted to be done by a cast of up-and-coming actors, agents, producers, casting directors, Hollywood VIPs had come to take a look, and the buzz was that my play would be going places. People were seeking me out. Actors listened when I spoke. <laughs> Hunky stagehands laughed at my jokes. One morning, I was seated in the communal dining room at a table with the hottest talents. Marsha Mason, who with her pretty good looks and infectious giggle was destined for stardom, we all knew it. Stephen, a sullen actor's studio member who uh, had just signed to play the lead in a TV biopic of James Dean, which we were sure would put him over the top. And Bobby Christian, a sleek black actor who had a habit of stripping off his shirt and doing push-ups during <laughs> rehearsal breaks so I could never look anywhere else. These were the people who sat at the center table, who were always having a grand time, and you didn't join them unless they sought you out. I, I don't remember how I got there, probably just the accident of finding myself next in line at the buffet, but they had a way of excluding you if they wished, and this morning they hadn't. I was enveloped in their sparkling company, watched and envied by every other writer in the room. I had ordered hard-boiled eggs for breakfast <laughs> and was having difficulty peeling one. The thin skin beneath the shell had not broken, so I was picking at it in little pieces, <laughs> making a mess mauling chunks of egg <laughs> with the slivers, anxious to get every word of the conversation. Bobby scoffs seductively, will you please peel that egg right? <laughs> My heart went into overdrive. Marsha giggled and asked what was wrong. He hasn't broken the skin on that egg, <laughs> and it's gonna drive me crazy. Bobby winked, Marsha collapsed in laughter, even Stephen deigned to smile. Everybody in the room leaned toward our table to find out what was funny, and I understood that it did not matter. These golden people would have laughed at anything. <laughs> so I laughed along, feeling delightfully desired, and most of all, embraced by the future. The three others watched while I tried to peel my egg, and the more I struggled, the more they laughed, and then they glowed with satisfaction when I had finally finished. So did everybody else in the room. My achievement rippled by the tables. <laughs> 
The walls seem to bow in celebration. The windows curl toward me, and outside, the sun shine brightly. That's what it's like to be young and talented and thrilled with what life has in store. My play went nowhere. It's no longer important why. Marcia married Neil Simon, but that fizzled, and her career turned cold. I see Stephen on commercials sometimes, but the sexy defiance is gone. Barbie Christian became the first person I knew to die of AIDS. Life was not meant to stay the way it was that sunny morning. Still, every time I peel a hard-boiled egg, I remember. I want to bring up our next writer, Jennifer Rawlings, um, who is the winner of the SCJWI Karen Cushman Award and Sue Alexander Grant Award for her novel. Um, she's also an award-winning writer, performer, and filmmaker who has appeared, you may have seen her on Comedy Central, CMT, PBS, VH1, a and &E, CNN, HLN, and in the film, I Am Battle Comic. She has two popular TEDx talks, and her solo show, I Only Smoke in War Zones, tours globally. Named one of the 21 changemakers of the 21st century by Women's E! News, Jennifer's directorial debut is a film called Forgotten Voices, Women in Bosnia, and it screams at film festivals and universities worldwide. She is the proud mother of five, and she's written for television, books, film, and several publications, including the New York Times. And she returns to our stage this afternoon with her personal show business story, Girl Comic. Please say hello to Jennifer Rawlings. Nineteen eighty-nine, Las Vegas, baby. A woman kneels jackpot as nickels tumble out of her slot machine. An older man whispers, jackpot. As a young thing wearing almost nothing <laughs> blows on his dice. The air in the casino is thick with cigarette smoke. And as I enter the ladies' bathroom, a hooker asks me if I have change for a $100 bill. <laughs> she offers me a line of Coke in exchange. <laughs> no thanks, I say. I'm working. So am I, she mumbles, <laughs> as she rubs the white powder into her gums. I reapply my lip gloss and prepare to head back on stage. I'm 23 years old, and for the next three days, I'm, in see I'm emceeing Bud Friedman's Las Vegas Comedy Convention. I mean, it is a BFD. Hundreds of comics have gathered here for their shots at fame and fortune. It's three days from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. There are four minute time slots all three days. Hundreds of comics showcasing for the most powerful people in comedy. All the network casting directors are there, plus agents, managers, you know, and the network suits. Comics are swarming around the, the bookers of The Tonight Show and Letterman, shoving VHS tapes into their hands. And the guy scouting for HBO's new channel called Ha, H-A, has been cornered all morning by a prop comic from Dallas. I reflect for a moment on how I got here. I've only been doing stand-up for a year. And I remember my first night in Los Angeles. I drove straight to the Hollywood Improv, introducing myself to Bud Friedman, the owner of the Improv. Hi, Bud. My name's Jennifer. Um, I'm a stand-up. Now, it wasn't a lie. I had done stand-up once. <laughs> and I decided, I'm ready to move to Los Angeles. So I tell Bud, I want to perform here. Oh, you have to come back the first Sunday of the month, he replies. You wait your line. You put your name in a hat. And I, th you know, and I think, well, why can't I just go on now? Bud shrugs and points me to the stage. I do a five-minute set, and in my memory, there were lots of laughs. <laughs> in reality, who knows? I walk off stage not giving Bud time to deliver a critique. 
you don't need to give me the best spots. I just want to work. Call in on Friday with your availabilities, he says. And just like that, I'm a stand-up comedian. <clears throat> a group of female comics enter the bathroom and jolt me back into the reality here in Las Vegas. A woman in her 50s extends her hand and says, I'm Robin. You're doing a great job up there. Thank you, I say. I can't wait to hear your stuff. Robin takes a deep breath. Did you know that the entire three days of this convention, not a single woman has gotten a time slot? It's all men. That can't be true, I think to myself. I drove across the country hoping for a spot, says one woman. I emptied my savings account, says another. It must be a typo. Let's go look at the list together. And together, we scan the list of performers. Friday, guy, guy, guy. Saturday, same thing. Sunday, once again, all male comics. I don't know what to say. I'm embarrassed and I'm angry. I am the only woman performing this entire convention. It's not right. But Bud's not going to change the lineup if I complain. He'll simply fire me and hire a guy. As I bring up the next performer, I spot a female casting director, and I have an idea. I sprint back to my comedy sisters. I know this is going to sound crazy, but we could do a showcase in my hotel room later on tonight. And any woman who has come to this convention that wants to perform, she can go on, and we will invite all the industry folks. Robin smiles, and so do the other women. That night, my tiny hotel room is crammed full of people. The crowd is spilling out into the hallway. There's no microphone, but that's OK, because the audience is hanging onto every single punchline these women deliver. One by one, I bring up these hilarious comedians. And at the end of the show, the audience gives these ladies a standing ovation. Jackpot. After 20 years at the Bronx Council of the Arts, Ed Friedman co-founded and served as the first executive director of Lifetime Arts, a nonprofit dedicated to providing opportunities for older adults in arts learning. He's commitment phobic when it comes to literary forms, and he flits from short plays to short fiction to short nonfiction, which is where Read 650 lives. And he says he has a high degree of success solving the New York Times crossword puzzle, except for Saturdays when he resists the urge to jump out his eighth story window. <laughs> He's a playwright whose work has been staged throughout New York and around the country, and his monologues and prose appear in many anthologies and literary journals. He makes his first trip to the Read 650 stage today to read the first time. Please welcome Ed Friedman. Thirty years old, and you're doing this for the first time. When you open the door of the Gray Cinder Block building, you see half a dozen young women and a few men learning dance steps in the lobby. You think, I hope I don't have to do that. <laughs> a woman with a clipboard, the universal indicator of authority, looks at you <laughs> as if you just got off the boat at Ellis Island in 1910. <laughs> Appropriate, as you've just entered a strange land where you don't know the language or the customs. Audition, she asks. Too nervous to speak, you nod and follow her finger to the auditorium, where about 30 people are dotted among the 200 seats, variously watching the stage or doing paperwork. You approach a beleaguered woman who is moving piles of paper. She hands you one. Fill it out and bring it back. You trudge up the aisle and plop down in a seat. You glance up at the stage. A tall bearded man is arranging people who are all holding pieces of paper. He steps off the stage. On his signal, they begin to read and somewhat tentatively start to move around the stage. You look back at your form. Beyond basic contact information, you have nothing to write. You have never been in a play. You have no training. What could you have been thinking walking in here? You think back to the first time you saw a stage play. You were 22, a revival of a streetcar named Desire with Rosemary Harris. Even with no knowledge of acting, you know she's wonderful. 
Since then, you've always fantasized about being on stage. The immediacy of live performance excites you, but you've always been too scared to try, until now. You've seen the shows here. The people on stage are bus drivers, teachers, civil servants, and secretaries. Maybe there could be a place for you here. At this moment, desire overcomes fear. You hand in your form to the beleaguered woman. She asks, what are you going to sing? Sing? <laughs> Red lights and an air raid siren go off in your head. This was not part of the plan. You don't even sing in the shower. Do I have to sing, you ask? She replies, you know, it's a musical. <laughs> in your head, she adds, you idiot. You start to back away, saying, sorry, my mistake. Part of you is relieved that you don't have to go through with this when the woman stops you and says, hang on. She heads for the bearded man. They engage in an animated discussion. When she comes back, you're told there's a small non-singing part available. She hands you a sheet of paper. She says, look this over. We'll call you in a few minutes. You retreat to a seat in the auditorium to study the part of the burlesque show manager with a sixth grade education who smokes a cigar. <laughs> you have no frame of reference for this. You don't even smoke. Fear is starting to overtake desire. When they call your name, it's reminiscent of hearing your name barked out at the draft board when you took your physical. The same terror. On stage, the bearded man, who you've now intuited is the director, explains the scene. The actress in the scene with you looks bored by the director's advice. You hang on every word. <laughs> the first time you do the scene, the director stops you and says, you sound too much like the college graduate you are. You do this scene again, trying to sound like the Fonz from Happy Days. <laughs> the bearded man says it was better. Then he says, we'll call you. Two days later, they did. 40 years later, you can't hear the overture to Gypsy without getting the chills. Aww. Though he's not listed in your program due to a typographical error, mine, uh, Anthony Murphy grew up in Lancashire, and he's worked and performed on the open mic spoken word scene in the UK and New York City for the last 15 years. He's written several poetry chapbooks, two illustrated children's books, and a novel, Shiftless, published by Atmosphere Press. A regular contributor to Read 650, he was most recently published in the Westchester Review and Long Islander. He lives by the Hudson River in Yonkers with his family, two dogs, and other wildlife, and he has traveled downriver this afternoon to share a slice of the rock and roll life that few of us, if we're lucky, will never have to experience. <laughs> Here to read Dad Rody is Anthony Murphy. I can't remember how many gigs you four boys had done those last two weeks, but we were now heading as far east in Europe as was booked. You had played Dresden, I remember liking, and now, after Prague, we kept moving. It was dark, early morning, December. The motorway was clear. You guys fell asleep in the back of the van immediately after the gig. Sometimes there's no after party. We had been traveling constantly, eating, sleeping in situ, no hotels for the last few days. You were all knackered. All I had to do was get you to Poland. There was only one bunk in the van, and you took it in turns. This time, Sam, the singer, was sitting right behind me. Then, the snow came down towards us. We were not moving forwards, and yet I was doing 50 miles an hour. We had entered a vortex. I gunned the van and squinted through the windshield. I wanted to outrun the avalanche. We had to beat the metronome. I couldn't tell if we were coming down off a mountain, though. As I drove forward, I felt like we were going backwards. The snow became horizontal, and no matter how much pressure I put on the accelerator, I was on a blank page going nowhere, except that it looked like we were now doing seven zero miles an hour and driving through a white field. 
forging our way east, apparently, but clueless as to where we were in the real world. I couldn't see our progress, and there was no way to know if anything was better up ahead. I was guessing. Some lights then, and a service station. I need to blink, so I pull in. You boys are still. I close my eyes after parking up and join you in sleep. When I wake after an hour or two, the snow is worse. We are between nowhere and somewhere, amidst blizzard and hill. I just want to get off the mountain, and we have to get to the venue by tomorrow afternoon. Today afternoon. I decide to chance it again, and I brush the excess snow off the windshield. My hands seize up. You guys are snug and useless. We have to get going. The engine starts. I let it warm and we pull out, skidding onto the autobahn and the van immediately turns side on into the middle of the three lanes. Like a dog on a trampoline, I halt, hunker down and wait for the world to stop with me. I was only going at 10 miles an hour and luckily, there are no fast approaching vehicles coming up behind, so after a still, silent second or two, I manage to rev, turn hard, reverse, and usher the tires into some kind of groove. I can see forward now, I think. And so, pump us on. I get up to speed. Maybe we are out of it, towards sea level, because then there is some slush and some traction and daylight. As I get back up to 70 and feel confident, the side door of the van suddenly opens. A rush of cold air and snow hits the back of my neck. Sam, the half-asleep singer, has decided to go pee. <laughs> the van swerves with my turnaround motion, and Sam swerves also. He holds on, though. Still semi-comatose, <laughs> braced at an open door on a motorway, letting it all hang out. As I then tell him, calmly as I can, to please sit down and I will pull over. <laughs> you, my son, and the rest of the band are all oblivious to this. The cold gusts of Eastern Europe do not wake the wearied Western heads of teenagedom. Sam staggers back into the confines of the van, and I break slowly and unskiddingly, manage to close the door with a side swipe of my gear free arm and exclaim just one loud. <laughs> Thank you. Ben Jacoby is a musician turned screenwriter who has written film and television projects for Universal, Paramount, 20th Century Fox, Hulu, Netflix, MGM, HBO, and Showtime, ranging from a biopic about Walter Cronkite to a globe-hopping action-adventure treasure hunt movie. Before all that, he answered phones and made copies in a variety of offices. He alphabetized books at Barnes & Noble, and he got fired for being a terrible bartender in Midtown Manhattan. A born and raised New Yorker, he tried to live in Los Angeles, but promptly fled back to Manhattan, where he lives with his wife, Catherine, when they're not traveling the world. His first produced film is currently shooting in Rome, a prequel to the horror classic, The Omen. And for those of you who have always wondered, Ben is here today to answer the question, what is a screenwriter? Please give a warm welcome to Ben Jacoby. Playwrights get a lot of credit. Novelists, too. Journalists. Those guys are real writers. Rolled up shirt sleeves, loose neckties, punching typewriter keys in a haze of cigarette smoke. Poets, definitely poets. I could give you a dozen who lived at the Chelsea Hotel alone. They bleed for their work, poets. Don't forget about nonfiction, historians, memoirists, Malcolm Gladwell, Michael Lewis types, these are serious writers, people. <laughs> Award-winning types. Upper West Side cocktail party turtleneck types. <laughs> but what the heck is a screenwriter? 
A guy at a party once asked me, so you like write the dialogue? <laughs> There was a time a producer fell asleep in the middle of one of my pitches, nodded off, and started snoring in an office on the 20th century lot, and then said, you know, screenwriting's pretty easy. I should try it. <laughs> I'm not bitter, I swear. <laughs> but you can see why people would think these things. Screenwriters are pretty anonymous. You've got your actors. You've got your set designers, your costume designers, your composers, cinematographers, editors, directors, on and on. <clears throat> and thank God, because I know nothing about cameras, or lights, or sound, I might as well try to split an atom. Surely all these people, the ones who actually know how to turn on a camera, are the ones responsible for the movie, right? There's tangible evidence of their work. Hey. Kind of. It's a little like saying the contractor is the one responsible for the building, or the conductor is the one responsible for the symphony. Okay. There's the old screenwriter joke where one screenwriter says to his screenwriter buddy, so my agent called me, told me the studio hates the latest draft. They're firing me off the project, canceling my office space, kicking me off the lot, blacklisting me around town. I'm going to lose my house and my car and my family and my dog and my career is over. And his buddy says, wait, your agent called you? <laughs> It's true, a screenplay is a blueprint, not a building. It's a score, not a symphony. When you don't have a camera and you're constructing a movie in your mind, you are doing just that. Okay? And you have to form a bit of a multiple personality disorder in order to do it right, one of many disorders screenwriters have. You have to design the sets in your mind, you have to write the music, you have to perform the roles, you have to frame the shots and light the rooms and so on. You have to create the full movie in your head. So of course, no one knows what the heck a screenwriter is, because for the most part, your scripts don't get made. And if you can't operate a camera, the only tangible proof of what you did is 120 pages of weird text formatting in an ugly font. <laughs> the movie only exists in your mind, unless the gods get together and decide to cut you a break and actually greenlight one. Then, of course, the composer gets the score wrong, the actors read the lines wrong, Cinematographer doesn't have a clue. The editor is completely off. And the director, the hired hand who's running the show, is less like a creative collaborator and more like one of those CEOs who ousts the startup founder and proceeds to strip the entire project of its soul. The perfect version of the movie you wrote only exists in one place, and no one ever gets to see that movie. So I had a moment of epiphany several years ago to just accept that, to be satisfied with the script for its own sake, not some other movie that some other people are going to make one day or that might not ever get made, the architect who is satisfied with his blueprints or the composer who's satisfied with his sheet music. And it worked for a little while. But then, inevitably, I realized I was fooling myself. So I wrote a new script, no producer, no studio, nobody, just me. And I went out, and I bought a camera. <laughs> Eight years ago, Edward McCann, an award-winning writer and producer, was at an uninspired public reading and thought, why not create a new kind of literary event that gathers a select group of talented writers to present five-minute or 650-word takes on a single topic? The idea became Read 650, which creates performance opportunities for writers and celebrates the spoken word through live and digital performances. Since that fateful day, Ed and a team of dedicated volunteers have worked to present hundreds of stories at dozens of carefully curated, high-quality events in association with partners like Vassar College, the National Arts Club, the New York Public Library, for the Performing Arts at Lincoln Center. Today, Read 650 engages audiences with regular live shows here at City Winery's flagship location in New York and with the regular half-hour podcast he launched in the spring of 2021 in association with Carnegie Hall. Ed's own writing has appeared in many journals and magazines, including Country Living, Better Homes and Gardens, Good Housekeeping, The Irish Echo, and The Sun. 
and he's a regular contributor to Milieu, a magazine about design. He lives and writes in the Hudson River Valley, and please join me in welcoming him back to the stage to close today's show business event with a visit to the Green Room. <laughs> Thank you. As a TV writer and producer, I have killed many hours with bad coffee in a variety of green rooms, which are rarely green and serve as holding pens where guests or performers ready themselves for their moment under the lights. My partner, Richard Kolath, was for several years a frequent on-camera guest, a seasoned designer and author. He often appeared in lifestyle segments on NBC, CBS, Lifetime, and Discovery. At the Today Show at 4 a.m. in a green room crowded with Elvis impersonators, <laughs> we shared cheese pastries with Al Roker. We carved jack-o'-lanterns outside the green room at Good Morning America. And while waiting to be called on set with Ernie Anastas, Richard discussed gumbo recipes with veteran journalist, uh, journalist Koki Roberts. We have shared green rooms and sofas with animal trainers, acrobats, and historians with spelling champions, novelists, and personal trainers. But green rooms at the shopping channel QVC are a world unto themselves. <laughs> QVC, for quality, value, and convenience, is a multi-billion dollar enterprise outside Philadelphia where, for a decade, Richard represented a line of traditional cotton quilts, chatting with the host and callers while selling hundreds of quilts per minute. A QVC green room is like a baseball dugout where you watch players on the field while waiting for your turn at bat. Flat screens display a live video feed plus colorful graphs and charts representing sales and dollars per minute. A real sense of urgency pervades and everyone hopes that their product sells out. That is the home run. Between Richard's quilt segments, often several hours apart, we watch a woman selling a miniature paraffin spa repeatedly dunk her elbow into a bath of molten citrus-scented aromatherapy wax. Then we watch the Breezy's pantyhose lady splay open her beautifully manicured hand inside a pair of hose, repeatedly showing viewers the special breathable crotch panel sewn into every pair. At the break, there's a tease for the jewelry hour, followed by a live cut-in from the Mall of America in Minnesota. Then, Marie Osmond is on screen laughing and talking with the host about her signature doll collection. The green room door opens, and a cluster of caffeinated people enter, juggling product samples, briefcases, and phones, talking of supply lines, package design, and units sold. An agitated vendor needs a model in a black bodysuit to demonstrate how his mattress conforms to you. Across the room, the magic dip tarnish remover man sorts noisily through a pile of vintage cutlery. A gaggle of plus-size models enter wearing hair rollers the size of soup cans. <laughs> Long stretches in the green room are surreal. Without windows, there is no day or night or season, and it's easy to forget what day it is. To reorient myself, I step into a corridor and I study autograph images of former guests Ernest Borgnine, Chubby Checker, <laughs> Linda Evans, the Smothers Brothers, Victoria Principal, and Tim Conway. I exchange cordial hellos with Joan Rivers, then spot a familiar face at the check-in desk. It takes me a moment to realize it's not a business associate or a former classmate. It's Potsy. <laughs> from Happy Days, also known as Anson Williams. He looks just like himself, only 25 years older, and he's here to sell his skin care regimen. <laughs> Marie Osmond is gone, and the scene has changed to a set where they're selling a carved wooden moose about 10 inches high. I watch as the guest inventor pours cup after cup of raisins, milk duds, and M&Ms, and jelly beans into a well in the moose's back, <laughs> then pumps its head up and down. With each pump, treats pop out the moose's butt into a shallow bowl or into the host's hand. 
This goes on for seven minutes while the host and the guest yuck it up and QVC's call centers struggle to keep up with the enormous demand for that pooping moose, which sells out and makes its inventor a wealthy man. That evening, Richard and I were out of the camera's view reviewing his lineup of quilts when Richard Simmons, in a sparkly tank top, satin shorts, and white sneakers, left his green room and jogged into the studio to pitch Deal a Meal, a new diet plan involving a deck of cards. As Simmons approached, he carefully picked his way through a nest of camera and monitor cables on the studio floor, then looked up, saw Richard, and gasped. That face, he exclaimed, pointing, so trustworthy. Oh, I'd buy anything from that face. You're going to do very well tonight. And he did. <laughs> well, the writers, come on up. <laughs> we built uh, Read 650 around live performances like this one, and I am proud to be here with this group of fine writers and proud of what this very small group of committed, unpaid volunteers has accomplished and continues to build with me. As I explained earlier, there are lots of moving parts to this organization, and we have room for more worker bees as volunteers or as advisory team members, especially in the areas of marketing and finance. Please do reach out if you'd like to discuss. You can always contact me with thoughts or suggestions via email at ed at read650.org. I hope you'll follow the podcast and allow us to stay in touch by adding an email address to one of the clipboards that's going around. And please save the date. We'll be back in this room on Sunday, October 16th, uh, with the theme of the day will be coming of age. Um, in Swahili, there is a well-loved phrase, uh, tuko pomoja, tuko pomoja, which roughly translates as we are together. And in my home and among my circle of friends, it's what we say when we raise a glass and a toast. And though there are many issues that divide our world, uh, all of us in the room are part of the same tribe, and we've come together to share and to celebrate the words. So I do say tuko pomoja to you. I'd love to hear it back. Tuko Pomoja, thank you. Uh, and again, from my heart, I'm grateful to all of you for your support. I hope you will consider investing in Read 650's mission today with a tax-deductible donation. We cannot do what we do without you, and you are the reason we're here. So this round of applause from us is for you. Thank you. Um, now, please do not rush off while there is wine to drink and people to meet. There is a reception for an hour that's going to go on here in the uh, outer room where you will also get to meet Rhonda Zangwill, who is our, our head donation lady. Um, and there's going to be charcuterie and open bar, etc. And the last thing we're going to do is something we haven't rehearsed before, which is a bow. So hold on. We're going to do this. Come on. Everybody out here? Okay. Thank <laughs> you.